I want to explore the colorful, colorful grace of God. And the main text of Scripture that we're going to look at is 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and take a look at that verse. This is going to be the main text of Scripture that we're going to draw all of the points from and just all the content from this message. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. And there's this, this short verse that speaks about the colorful grace of God. And different translations translate these Greek words a little differently. From the New King James Version, the Bible says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now the interesting thing about this word that Peter uses, in the Greek it's pronounced pokilos, and I'm, I'm just in the 21st generation here, an American trying to pronounce Greek, okay? So I'm not saying I'm an expert on the pronunciation, but I am an expert at using a concordance. I'm really good at that, okay? And the meaning of this word actually means varied in appearance. That is of various nature and character. It means diverse. It means manifold, and that's the way that the New King James Version translators translated this Greek word. But one of the common uses of this word in Greek is many-colored or colorful. And so what Peter is trying to describe here is he's trying to describe God's grace in a way that we can begin to grasp and comprehend that it's not just this general word that has a definition. And I'm going to share some definitions and we're going to explore God's grace and these different variations and colors of God's grace today. But he wants us to know that it's colorful and that it's vibrant and that it's alive and that there's variations to it and it affects us and so many different ways. When I was thinking about this message, and you can probably tell from the slides, I was thinking about a painter's palette, and I was thinking about uh, paint, and all the paint that ends up on a painter's palette, and how they can mix those colors together to create something amazing. And in our family, we grew up in a line of artists. I don't know, somehow it skipped our dad. I'm not sure. He's a veterinarian, and so he's really great at the math and sciences, but his dad was a professional artist. He was a graphic designer, advertising, professional painter. Our great-grandfather was also a painter, and so all of our homes are filled with original paintings from our, our, our grandfathers. And uh, when I was growing up, my mom used to say that the only thing that my dad could draw is flies. And for the longest time, I was trying to figure out what that meant when I was a kid. I was like, can dad actually draw flies? But then as I got older, I realized she was just talking that you know he attracts flies. Um, I, okay, so anyway. <laughs> but uh, he's a great veterinarian, an amazing veterinarian. But for whatever reason, the whole artistic thing didn't, didn't quite uh, come to him. So we've always grown up around art. It's all around us. And we have these beautiful paintings that our, our grandfather had painted. And when I was younger, I, I took to art pretty quickly. And I actually, I wanted to become a professional caricaturist. You know those guys at Valley Fair that draw like the cartoons of your face? And when I was like 10, 12 years old, I was like practicing and I would go to the mall and I'd see those guys. I was like, yes, that is a career right there. I want that career. And I like envisioned myself driving a Jaguar to the mall and drawing like caricatures. And I was going to be this wealthy caricature artist. And I used to draw like cartoon strips. And then I realized, wait a minute, okay, I, I need to figure out a better career path because I don't think I'm going to quite cut it drawing people's faces at Valley Fair. And uh, so I, I started to study architecture when I was 13 years old. And when I got into high school, I became really interested in architecture so that that artistic aspect of our, our family, that always kind of stayed with me. And so I, I started studying architecture. And one of the periods of architecture that I appreciated the most was the neoclassical uh, period of architecture. And that's when uh, the Dark Ages went into the Renaissance and there was this birth of art artistic talent in poetry and in design and in architecture and in theater. And uh, one of the, the ones that was most influential during that, that, that period of time that influenced the world still to this day was the artist Michelangelo. And I think still to this day, with all the studying that I did, obviously I didn't become an architect, but I, I studied a lot and I still really enjoy architecture. And one of the things that I've noticed that probably more than any other country in history that has influenced architecture is probably Italy. They have some of the most incredible architecture in all of the world. And a lot of that was inspired by the artists of that time. And Michelangelo was one of those artists. And it, if you remember, he's the one that painted the Sistine Chapel. He's really well known. Uh, and he said that he could look at a raw block of marble 
And before ever even touching a chisel to the marble, he could completely envision what he was going to bring out of that, that, that uh, raw chunk of rock. And he was able to create something beautiful, something that the world would know about for generations to come. He was an amazing artist. And this is actually one of his quotes. He said, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved it until I set it free. And I believe that that describes, in a way, God's grace in such a colorful way in our lives. You need to know something, before we get into some of these Bible verses in this message, that your life is a masterpiece of God. And God wants to create something incredible. He wants to create something beautiful. And if you'll offer your life to God like a blank canvas, and say, God, you paint whatever you want. God, you use the color of your graces and all of the varieties and all of the shades and all of the different aspects and facets of your grace to design my life, God will do it. But God is going to not paint a portrait of you. He's going to paint a portrait of His Son, Jesus. He wants to make your life and my life more like Jesus. And the way that God accomplishes that is through an abundance of His graces. His grace is so colorful. It's so deep. 1 Peter 4.10 in the Amplified, our main text of Scripture, and I wanted to read this from the Amplified. It says, as each of you has received a gift, a particular spiritual talent, a gracious divine endowment, employ it for one another as benefits good trustees of God's many-sided grace. Another way that you could look at God's grace, not just in a colorful way, but is it's multidimensional. There's many different varieties, and there's all sorts of broadness and depth to the grace of God. The many-sided grace. And the Bible says, as faithful stewards of the extremely diverse powers and gifts granted to Christians by unmerited favor. God has empowered you with grace. And God wants that grace to be released. In the context of what Peter's actually speaking about, how this is actually working out, is in the context of church and the relationships that we have as Christians. And what's happening in church and in small groups and in Bible studies and what's happening in worship and prayer groups, that affects other people all around us in the workplace. That affects people on the streets, in the parks, at school. Wherever we are, we can be an instrument of God's grace. But we need to bring ourselves to God and we need to allow God to paint a beautiful portrait of His Son, Jesus. Amen? We need to be marked by the grace of God. Before we get into this message, I I like to pray a lot. Have you noticed that about me? I like to pray a lot. And so I just want to pray and just really ask God just to bless the service that we have here in this word. Heavenly Father, we come and we just ask, Lord, that your word would speak to us this morning, Father. God, I pray that you would give us grace to bring our lives before you as a blank canvas and that, God, you would just paint, Lord, a beautiful portrait of your son, Jesus. Lord God, that you'd make us more like Christ that, Lord, you'd fill us with the good graces of Christ, that you'd fill us, Lord, with the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit, that, Lord God, we may emulate Christ to the world, that, Father, others would be affected by the grace of God that's within us, Lord. I pray that, Father God, you would bless us as we meet here together today, Lord, as we desire to hear from you, as we come to worship you and offer ourselves to you. Lord, we want to be transformed by you. God, I pray that you'd give me grace, Lord, as I read your word and as I preach your word and share it, God. I pray that, God, it would be teachable, that it would be tangible, that, God, it would be transforming in our lives. And that, Father, we would not walk out of here the same way that we walked in. That, God, we'd walk into 2013 with a clearer understanding of your grace. Holy Spirit, come and anoint me and use my life right now, Father, to deliver your word to the people that you so love. God, give us a revelation of your grace. And Lord, how colorful and how beautiful it is. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I'm just going to simply ask three questions for the points. And the first one is this. What is grace? What is grace? It's a very common question. It's something that we talk about all the time. The Bible is filled with stories and verses that express the grace of God. We hear about it on the radio. We hear about it in music. But really, what is the grace of God? 
since grace is so colorful and since grace is so deep and since it's so multidimensional, the Bible speaks about grace in a multitude of different ways. And so what I did is I went through mainly the New Testament and studied grace, and I, I grabbed some of the, the main definitions of grace. These are some of the most common definitions of grace. That which causes joy. That's grace. That which causes pleasure or favor or acceptance. Grace is a kindness that's granted to us or something that's desired. Grace is something that is beneficial. It's a favor that's done without expectation of return. Grace is the free expression of God's loving kindness. It's the unearned or the unmerited favor of God. Through the grace of God, we're not only forgiven, but this is one of the most amazing things about grace. Not only are we forgiven by grace, but we also, we receive joy. We receive thankfulness. And that joy and that thankfulness is what motivates us to love and to seek God. Grace is every kind of kind favor. It's every kind of blessing. And it's every kind of goodness that proceeds from the Father. This is grace. This is grace. If you ask a lot of people to explain what grace is, they'll probably just take you back to the cross and they'll only be able to express to you the grace of Jesus Christ and salvation. And although that's where grace really starts with us as Christians and we really experience firsthand the grace of God when we come and we trust Christ as our Savior and we know our sins have been forgiven and we've been transformed and our lives have been renewed with joy, grace goes far beyond that. You see, there's common grace that God gives to all men, believers and unbelievers alike. There's common grace. I mean, the rain, it falls on the just, and the rain, the same rain, falls on the unjust. That's just the common grace of God to all men. The sun is the common grace of God. God is faithful. No one in all the universe has the power, the authority, or the control to make the sun rise every day and set every night. But God is faithful, and He shows His mercy and His grace to all men. That's common grace, but there's unique and special grace that God gives to the Christian, to the child of God who's trusted Christ as their Savior. And it starts in salvation, at salvation when you trust Christ as your Savior. This is God's grace or God's unmerited favor. This is the efficacious power that He has conferred upon sinful men and that He's blessed us by bringing us salvation. Amen? The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one of us that have made it with God. We've all missed the mark. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken His commandments. In another passage of Scripture in Romans, the Bible says we're all like sheep and we've all gone astray. And each of us is pursuing our own way until the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, comes. He reveals Himself to us in our need for His salvation. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But this is how our lives are transformed. We're justified freely by His what? His grace. Amen? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Several of us, we've experienced that before. That freedom, that justification, that we're no longer condemned under God's judgment or under God's wrath, but that the righteousness of Christ has been put to our account. And this all happens because of God's incredible, amazing, transcendent grace. Amen? We've experienced that, so we understand that. The Bible tells us in John a little more about Jesus. And the Bible says, and of His fullness, think about this now, of His fullness we've all received in grace for grace. Now when the New King James is speaking about grace for grace, it's literally saying grace on top of grace. Another way you could say that is spiritual blessing on top of spiritual blessing or favor upon favor. And the idea that John is trying to get us to understand about Jesus Christ is that we've all, of His fullness, we've all received grace on top of grace on top of grace, favor on top of favor on top of favor. So much so that it's piled up and it's heaping over. That's what he wants us to understand about God's grace. It's piled up so high that it's heaping over. And the Bible says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
And it's through Christ that you and I, of His fullness, His vastness, His greatness, His depth, all of those eternal properties of God that cannot be fully understood or fully explored, but they can, on a daily basis, be experienced through His abundant grace. And what God will do for those that start to tap into this by faith is He's going to add grace on top of grace. Spiritual blessing on top of spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor. Through difficult times, dry times, through temptations and struggles, through heartache, through the good times, through the bad times, through the times we laugh, through the times we cry, God will take grace and He'll pile it up so much so on top of you through Jesus Christ that it will be heaping over. Grace on top of grace. Uh, on top of grace. But this is where a lot of times we as Christians, we limit grace. And we say, okay, I understand that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Obviously, God, if He didn't love me, He wouldn't have sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sin. Yes, I believe. Jesus, He loves me. God loves me. And because of His great and abundant and mighty grace, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save me. But God has so many more colors to show us. That's just one color. There's so many other mixtures of colors that bring about different shades of God's grace that He wants to reveal to us. There's a broader scope that God wants us to understand and He wants us to tap into as His people. So you're going to have to go beyond just thinking that grace stops at the cross. That grace stops at that moment of salvation. But grace is something that God wants to be, He wants it to be abundant in your life. And so we need to understand that it goes beyond this and we need God's grace in every possible way, in every regard, in our spiritual lives as we walk out the Christian life. We must include this constant thought in our hearts, our minds, in our belief that God loves us and God wants to continue through Jesus Christ to add grace on top of grace. God wants to continue to add favor to every area of our lives. God is going to continue to add spiritual blessings and it will continue to be bestowed on us through Christ. So not only is there grace at salvation, but there's grace in our daily living. Amen? I thank God for His grace in daily life. Grace also refers to, I've read many definitions, but one of the other definitions that we find in the Bible is that it refers to the conferring of special gifts, or favors, or benefits, and blessings to the redeemed. There are so many beautiful shades of God's grace that He wants us to see and to experience. Ephesians 4 says, Yet grace, God's unmerited favor, was given to each of us individually. Not indiscriminately, but in different ways in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. Man, that's something you need to just sit back for about five seconds and just take that in and say, wait a minute, God's grace was not just given to us as a whole, but God's grace is given to me individually. For my individual problems, for my individual failures, for my individual difficulties, for my individual struggles. God's grace has been given to me individually in so many different ways. And He's given it to us in proportion to the measure of Christ. And what did we learn about Christ? And of His fullness, we have all received this grace on top of grace on top of grace. Can anyone here begin to express or explain the fullness of Christ? In 10 years of studying the Bible, I could not express to you the fullness of His grace, and I don't believe that anyone fully can. I know that there's people that can do it a lot better than me, and I know with time I'll be able to do it better and better and better because I want to grow in grace and grow in knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. But there's no one who's ever lived that can even begin to fully express the fullness of His grace. And this is something that's been given to you and I individually. So when we receive Christ, this is what actually happens to us. Our nature, when we trust Christ as our Savior, our nature is brought under righteousness. And because our human nature is now brought under the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you and I are able to do something that we were never able to do before we came to Christ. And that is that we are able to maintain unbroken and a an immense supply of God's grace. We can remain in unbroken fellowship with Jesus every single day. 
and find an, imm an, an immense, abundant supply of God's grace. You and I need that each and every day. 2 Corinthians tells us that God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Not only does it say that God is able to make all grace either come to you or fill you, but the Bible says that He's able to make all grace abound. It will come and it will abound in your life. It's His grace that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Man, we need to live in the daily grace of God. You know, if we don't live in the grace of God, we're going to have a nervous breakdown. I'm serious. You know, life is stressful. Everything that's going on around us, jobs and family and politics and our nation and everything that's happening all around us, we need grace. And by the, by the grace of God, as children of God, we need to trust that God is going to supply that grace in our daily lives. We live a very busy life, our family. Uh, our family owns a veterinary hospital in New Brighton, and sister is the practice manager there, and I'll tell you, she's an amazing manager. <laughs> she's a great leader, an amazing manager, and uh, I work with her in the business office. Uh, our dad is a veterinarian there. My mom, for years, she built the business with my dad for almost 40 years, um, and she's now retired. And some of you may know my mom uh, has some, some health issues that she's struggling with right now. Last June, she had open heart surgery, and she's still recovering from that. And um, with everything going on in life, starting up a new church, and you know, we're working hard at our, our family's business, and my mom is, has health concerns, and my wife and I have a little girl, and we have another baby on, on, on his way or her way in June. And um, I go into the bank for uh, my family about three times a week. And I walked in the bank a, a couple weeks ago, and I go in there so often that they know who I am. They know all of these different things that are going on in life. They know about my mom's situation. They know about our business. They know about the church plan. And they said to me, they said, Grant, how do you do it? How do you do it? I mean, sometimes I work 40, 60 hours a week and still have time for my family and still have time for God and ministry. And people say, how do you do it, Grant? All I said was, God's grace. God's grace. I mean, if it wasn't for God's grace, I would have given up a long time ago. I would have been burnt out. I would have been shut down. I would have had a nervous breakdown. I would have said, I can't take any more. But I believe and I experience the daily grace of God. It doesn't matter if it's marriage. It doesn't matter if it's a job. It doesn't matter if it's school. It doesn't matter if it's an area of your Christian life. It doesn't matter what it is you need the daily grace of god you need a daily supply of god's grace it's immense it's accessible and it will radically change everything that's going on in your life for all these things are taking place for your sake so that the more grace divine favor and spiritual blessing extends to more and more people and multiplies through the many, the more thanksgiving may increase and redound to the glory of God. This is God's heart and His desire for grace. God doesn't just want to give you a little bit of grace and just kind of get you by. God wants more and more grace. He wants the grace that's affecting your life to affect the lives of other people around you because the more that we live in the grace of God, the more we know that it's God doing the work in our lives. And what does that do? It causes you to praise Him. It causes you to glorify Him. So what God wants is He wants grace to multiply or exponentially grow in your life. Amen? That's what grace is. That's good, amen? So here's the other question for you is, where is grace? So if that's what grace is, and that's kind of how grace is used in my, my, my life, where is it? How do I find it? I mean, because that's, that's the thing that we got to know. I mean, it's one thing to find what grace is, but the other question is, I've got to find where grace is because I need grace. If God is really going to do those things for me, then I've got to know where it is, and I've got to know how to apply it to my life. Before I tell you where grace is, I've got to tell you one more thing that God wants you to know about grace. And this really encouraged my heart years ago as a Christian. In Hebrews 13, the Bible says, Don't be carried about by different and varied and alien teachings, 
Literally, he's saying foreign teachings or strange teachings that are contrary to what God's Word says. God does not want you to drift away from what the Bible actually says about any area of God, but especially grace. The Bible says, for it is good for the heart to be established and ennobled and strengthened by means of grace. So before I tell you where grace is, I want to tell you this about grace. God wants your heart to be established and strengthened by a means of grace. And you know where God's going to bring you right back to? Grace. That's where God's going to bring you right back to, grace. Because God wants you to abide. And He wants you to live in and dwell in and remain in the grace of Jesus. He wants you just to remain in the grace that He has provided for you through His Son, Jesus. He wants you to abide. It's where you will find strength. It's where you will find joy. It's where you will find peace. It's where you will find encouragement. And this is the way God says it's a good thing for your heart to be established. The reason that blessed me so much is because I realized when I came across that verse that my heart wasn't very well established yet. And so I, I felt like I was going in and out of grace, in and out of grace. And sometimes I was trying to do it on my own, and I'd fall, and I'd fail, and it hurt, and it was hard. And I realized that God wants my heart to be established by this means of His grace. And He wants me to be established in His truth, and He doesn't want me to, to uh, deviate from that truth. He wants me to remain there. It's the safest and the best place for you and I as Christians. So I want to tell you this about grace. Grace is a place. Grace is a place. But it's not a place physically. It's a place spiritually. It's a place that you and I, we need to learn how to stand there. And it's a place that we need to learn to believe in. You see, what you truly believe in your heart about grace will determine where you stand in regards to it. So if your heart doesn't really believe in God's grace and you just kind of believe God will just kind of help you kind of get by, but that God isn't really there to show you spiritual favor and that God really isn't there to bless you, then that's where you stand in regards to it. But there's other people that say, wait a minute, if this is what God's Word says, I don't care what I think, I don't care what I've experienced in the past, I don't care what my feelings or my emotions are telling me, but I'm going to believe in this kind of abundant grace that God gives. And I'm going to live there by faith. Those people experience grace on a daily basis. So grace is a place. Not physically, but it's spiritually. And what you believe about it determines in where you stand in regards to it. This is what Roman tells us about the place of God's grace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's speaking about salvation. There's no more animosity. There's no more hostility. There is no more wall between us and God. It's been broken down, that middle wall of partition, as the Bible says. And we have been joined and we have been united with God through Jesus Christ. How does that happen? It doesn't happen through our works. It doesn't happen through our church attendance. It doesn't happen because we are good. The Bible says we've been justified by faith. My faith is not in what I've done. My faith is in what Christ has done for me because Jesus died on the cross and He said, It's finished. The work has been accomplished. Salvation is secure for all of those who believe and trust in Jesus. So the Bible says now we have peace. There's no more hostility between us and God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, through whom, Jesus, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So two important things we need to understand about grace. First of all, grace has to be accessed. Faith has, our grace has to be accessed. If you don't know how to access this fullness of God's grace, it's going to be difficult to live in this kind of abundant grace. So the grace of God, we have to be able to access it. How do we access the grace of God? We access the grace of God by faith. Now, faith might go contrary to what you think or what you believe or what you've been taught. The Bible says in Romans, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You always believe what you hear. The question is, whose voice are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the voice of the world, or are you going to listen to the voice of God from His Word? 
And so when you read the Word of God and you meditate on the Word of God, you start to realize and understand, wait a minute, whoa, this is real. God's got abundant grace for me to live in. Now the question is, I've got to access that grace. How do I get a hold of that grace? And how do I apply it to my life? How do I apply it to my situations? How do I apply it to my temptations and my difficulties? Because I'm tired of doing this on my own, and I want to do it with Christ. I want Him to do it in me. I want Him to do it through me. So you have to access grace by faith. And the Bible says when you access it by faith, you enter into grace. Are you seeing this? You enter into grace, and then what do you do once you get there? You stand. You stand. So you access it by faith. You enter into grace, and then you stand. Now see, that's something that you're going to have to do in your life. If you want to access this kind of grace. You see, grace is a place. And Jesus, he spoke about this, this place. It was a physical place where he would resort to and where he encouraged other Christians to resort to. And he called it a prayer closet. You ever heard of one of those before? A prayer closet. A closet's a physical place. Ours is filled with clothes. Fortunately, it's big enough you can even pray in there if you really want to. It doesn't literally have to be a prayer closet, a closet especially for some of you girls that have a lot of clothes in your closet. But what it does refer to, it refers to a physical place where you can get alone with God. And if you can get to that physical place called a prayer closet, the spiritual is just a step of faith away. And it's that prayer closet that encourages us to get alone and to get intimate with God. Now, this is just the way it seems to me as a Christian, and the, the, what I've been learning as a Christian. It seems to me that the people that access the grace of God the most are the people that access their prayer closet the most. It's just the way it seems to me. It's what I've understood about Christianity. It's what I've grown to understand, is that the people that go to their prayer closet the most are the people that experience the, the, the greatest, abundant supply of God's grace. Why? Because they've learned to access it by faith. They've learned to enter into this place of grace. And they've learned to stand there by faith. Amen? This is the following part. I love this part about Romans right here. I mean, we're talking about entering into this place of grace, accessing it by faith, standing there secure. And these are the very next verses that Paul is writing to the church in Rome. He says, and not only that. I mean, that would be enough, right? That would be enough. For us to access the grace of God. But he says, not only that, I've got more I've got to tell you about this. And this is what he goes on to say. He says, but we also glory in tribulations. What? Are you serious, Paul? Are you crazy? I don't know about any of you. I don't like going through tribulations. I don't like going through difficulties. And the last thing that I want to do when I'm going through a difficulty, what did he say? Glory? Rejoice? Praise God? No way. When I go through difficulty, I'm going to complain. I'm going to make everyone else's life miserable because of what I have to go through. It's not even my fault. I have to go through this tribulation. I can't believe I have to go through this. It's so hard. It's so dark. It's so difficult. I'm going to make everyone else's life miserable, including my own. You see, your actions will hurt others, but your reactions will hurt yourself. And so you get yourself into this place where you're in a tribulation and you're complaining about it. Why? Because you didn't read the first couple of verses in Romans 5, 1 and 2 that speak about how to access grace. People that access grace glory in their tribulations. And that's how you can tell if you're living in grace or not. Because the person that's living by grace is the person that's glorifying God, praising God, rejoicing in God, even through their tribulations. And so he says, knowing, and this is the knowledge that grace gives you. See, knowledge, the grace will teach you more about God. And so the Bible says, glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation, what does it produce? It produces perseverance. Now these people are going to be steadfast for God. And perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And those that have accessed grace by faith and stand in grace, they, hope that, they know that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit 
who has been given to us. These are people that experience God. These are people that have a connection with God. And they experience God. How can this be so? It all happens because they know where grace is. And they enter into that place. And they experience the love of God being showered out on their heart. They experience the empowering and the strength and the joy that can only come from the Lord. Hebrews also tells us about this place of grace. It says, let us then fearlessly, let us confidently, and let us boldly draw near to the throne of grace. You see, there's a throne of grace that you can come to, but you have to go there. I can go there for you. I can. I'll go there for you if you need me to. But ultimately, what God wants each and every person in this room to learn how to do is to go to the throne of grace on your own. He wants you to experience it for yourself. So the Bible says, let us in fearlessly and confidently and boldly, let us draw near. Let's get closer to the throne of grace. Let's go to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor for sinners. That we may what? What are we going to do once we get there? We're going to receive. What are we going to receive? We're going to receive mercy for our failures. And we are going to find something there. What are we going to find? We're going to find grace to help in good time for every need. Appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. Have you ever been in a place in your life and it's just like you're about ready to lose it? You ever been there? Okay, if you haven't, you're going to get there someday, okay? <laughs> Trust me, just have a kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding about that no um but when you get to that point and it's like god you've got to break through god i have need of this god you've got to do something about that man just go to the throne of grace just get you to the throne of grace <laughs> whatever you got to do you get to the throne of grace and when you get there you tell god all about your need you tell god everything that's on your heart you tell him how much it hurts you tell him how much you're broken. You tell him whatever you need to tell him. Pour your heart. The, this is what the Bible says you do when you get to the throne of grace. The Bible says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. You cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So all those cares, all those burdens, all those trials, all those difficulties, all those things that hold you down every day, get in your prayer closet by faith. Draw near to the throne of grace. Cast your cares upon the Lord. And what are you going to find? The Bible says that you will find grace to help you. Grace will help you. You all have a big test coming up. Okay? Get in your prayer closet and get before God. If you can't get enough privacy as roommates, then get a couple of roommates together and say, let's go to the throne together, okay? That's a whole other message there. <laughs> if it's in marriage whether it's apart or together, to the throne of grace and say, this is what we have need of. Don't fight about it. Don't argue about it. Don't complain about it. Certainly don't worry about it. Just make sure that you get what you need from God. So let me just close up with this point right here. Why do I need grace? We've talked about what grace is. We've talked about where you can find grace. But why do I really need grace? Well, one, obviously, is that we need grace to save us from our sin. I mean, we are sinful and we are contaminated. We come into this world and we're born as sinners and you don't have to even teach a, a child how to sin. I mean, they just naturally learn how to lie. They learn how to steal. And if we've offended God in one point of the law, the Bible says that we've broken all of the law. We've seen from Romans, the Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But see, we're freely justified by faith because of this abundant grace that's in Christ Jesus. We know that, right, as the church? Amen? If you know that, say amen. amen. So why do I need grace? Another area that we need God's grace in is because we live in a sinful world, and there's temptation that's all around us, and there's struggles that we face to forsake God every day. And with the increase of temptation and sin, we need God's abundant grace. Romans tells us the law came, came in only to expand and increase the trespass. But where sin increased and abounded, grace, God's unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased the more. And I love the Amplified when it says it's super abounded. It's like sin, come on. 
Sin's so big, bad, it's ugly. The temptation is so strong, it's such a struggle. But the Bible says that God's grace superabounds. But see, God's grace isn't just something that's going to be physical. You see, temptation is physical. It's all around us. Our eyes see something that we lust. Our flesh covets after something. We crave after something that God has forbidden. But grace is something that you have to access by faith. It's something that has to be accessed by faith. So where sin increased and it abounded, it's going on all around us and it's not going anywhere until the final end. Grace, or God's unmerited favor, has surpassed it. God's grace goes beyond sin. It goes beyond the temptation. So see, when you find yourself in a place where you're struggling in a temptation, cry out to God and say, wait a minute, God, your word says that your grace surpasses the temptation. Your grace is greater than the sin that I'm facing. Your grace is greater than the worry. Your grace is greater than this broken heart. And you start to enter in and you start to access that grace that God has. We need grace in every area of life. Another area that we need God's grace in is just strength every day. The Bible says He gives us more and more grace. I mean, the grace that I've experienced in my past, it's not done. It's not over with. I've got new grace today. Tomorrow I'm going to go to Jesus and I'm going to get more grace for tomorrow. You'll see me back here next Sunday because I'm going to get more grace for next Sunday. And I'm going to keep going to Jesus and I'm going to keep going to Him and I'm going to keep getting not just grace, but I'm going to get more and more and more. You get the idea? And more grace. The Bible says this is the power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. That is why he says, God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace. Who does God give grace to? First of all, we've got to know, God doesn't give grace to proud and haughty people. Because proud and haughty people, they're living their life on their own accord. They're living their life in their own strength. I mean, sooner or later they're going to fall, and it's going to hurt. And that's God's grace is there to pick, pick them back up, right? But who does God give this grace upon grace upon grace to? He says, he gives grace continually to who? The lowly. Those who are humble enough to receive it. I'll tell you what, humble people know where their prayer closet is. Humble people know where their prayer closet is. Humble people. The lowly know where to go. You see, because when you go in your prayer closet, you're not going to stand up over God, acting like you know everything. You come and you come with a broken heart contrite, lowly, desperate, hungry, needy. And God loves it when we come like that. It shows our need for God. It shows the expectation that we have of Him and that we wait upon Him. And so when we come lowly, the Bible says He gives us grace. And He gives us more grace. I mean, who's going to walk into the throne room of God like, all right, God, here I am again. Give me some grace. Come on, just lay it on me, God. And I'll tell you what, you come crawling sometimes on your knees. You come crying. You come desperate. And when you come to that place in the throne of grace, there is some kind of divine interaction that happens between God and man. And there is some kind of grace that's imparted into your life that will change the circumstance that you're living in. I need God's grace. It gives me strength every day. I need God's grace to grant me favor and blessing throughout my life. Look at this verse once again in 2 Corinthians. God is able... I'm not able, you're not able, abundant life in, its, in and of itself is not able, but God is able to do what his word says that he's able to do, and that is to make all grace, all of it, everything that you have need of, all grace, every favor and every earthly blessing come to you in abundance. Man, that takes the weight right off of my shoulders. Reading that verse just takes the weight right off of my shoulders. Now, that doesn't mean I can be foolish about life. It doesn't mean that I, I don't have to save money. It doesn't mean that I don't have to be wise and make good decisions. Because I, I, I have to. And actually, the context of 2 Corinthians, if you read it in chapter 8, Paul is speaking about tithes and offerings. He's talking about monetary giving to the church. That's what he's talking about. That's the context. And this is what I love about the Bible. See, men don't just, a lot of men just don't teach this. I mean, you've got to get this straight from the Word of God. Don't take my word for it as a man. 
You get it from the Word of God. You see, men will teach you that if you give to God, God will give you more money. If you give more money to God, God will give you more money. And they make it about money. And it's like, okay, if I give money to God, then God is going to give me more money. More money. More money. But this is what I love about God. You see, because there's things in my life that I need more than money. There's things in my life I need more than money. Money's not going to take care of all my problems. I need health. I need health. I need joy. I know people that have a lot of money and they have no joy. Money won't take care of all your problems. You need it for some things in life like paying off school, right? <laughs> Driving a car, right? Buying lots of formula in our case. You need money. But this is what I love about this verse. This is the context of what he's talking about. He's not saying that God is going to give you more money. He's saying God is able to make all grace, every favor, and every earthly blessing come to you. How's it going to come? It's going to come to me in abundance. So now it's not just money. But what I really have from God is I have his grace. And it's not about the money in the first place. This isn't a message on tithing. It's about having a grateful heart that gives cheerfully to the Lord. And what God gives back is abundant grace. So that you may always, and under all circumstances, and whatever the need, you will be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid, no support, and furnish in abundance for every good work and every charitable donation. God says, I'm going to give you everything that you have need of. Man, this is why I need grace. I hope you're starting to see that this is why you need grace too. You see, this is what the Bible says to us as Christians. It says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. This is what God's Word is saying to every single one of us, including myself. Grow in grace. This is something that all of us need to grow in. It's something that all of us need to experience more of. There's a story, and I'm just going to close with a story. In the book of Acts chapter 11, amazing things were happening throughout Jerusalem and throughout that region of the world. And if you remember in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit of God did something that God has never done in the history of the world. He poured Himself out on the church. And hundreds and then thousands of people started to experience God for the very first time. Miracles were happening. Worship was happening. Prayer, ministry, evangelism. The church was being persecuted. And Christians started to run to other areas. And it was actually part of God's plan because then other areas and other regions and other countries started to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And more people were giving their lives to Christ. And God was just doing an incredible work throughout that entire area of the world in that first century church. And in Acts chapter 11, there's a man by the name of Barnabas, and he traveled with Paul. And they had sent him to an area that was near Antioch. And when he was there, the Bible says that he had seen the grace of God. You see, some of us have to catch a glimpse of the grace of God in someone else's life. And Barnabas, he saw the grace of God. Everywhere he went all around Antioch, he saw people that had given their lives to Christ, people that were living by faith, people that were worshiping God in the church, and they were experiencing God on a daily basis. And the Bible says that he saw the grace of God, and the Bible says that he was glad. And he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. So my admonition for all of you today is this. Continue with the Lord. Make 2013 a year that you continue with the Lord and you press in harder to the Lord and you grow in more grace and you grow in more knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? So other people can see it. Someone's got to step out in faith and say, I want my life to be a beautiful portrait of the colorful grace of God. So wipe it clean and hand God a blank canvas and say, God, paint it. Make it look like you. 
Make it beautiful. Make it colorful. Teach me the multi-dimensional and the different aspects and these variations of your grace so others can see the grace of God in my life. And so I can reveal to others the colorful grace of God. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.